Nate Silver arguing that um, Trump is catching up. See, it's the curve, right? Because there's a very small period of time where Trump's numbers are increasing. It therefore follows that Trump's numbers will increase at the same rate of change into perpetuity. Meaning that in the year 2050, Trump will have 10,000% of the, of the vote. Nate Silver has managed to prove that people that are not born yet will vote for Donald Trump in the future. Excuse my contempt. The polls here that he's using, first of all, okay, forget about his model. He's, he's putting garbage into the system. And so he's going to get garbage out of it. He, like, he's putting the Gravis poll in. Now, I know that, that these people want to argue that you just take every poll you can find and then you let them balance each other out. I think that's ridiculous. <laughs> all right? When, you don't... Like, you know that that's a skewed poll, right? He's using online polling, right? So he's taking a bunch of garbage, he's put, putting it into his model, and he, he's getting a bunch of garbage out of it, right? A lot of garbage averaged out is not a good result. When you average out a bunch of garbage, the result is just still a bunch of garbage. Whatever model you want to use. I don't, I don't really like... Or I don't really think that it's... I, I think it's very perilous to try to build these kinds of predictive modeling um, around elections, because it's not... It, 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 it's, it's a... It, it just does not make sense to model elections. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like it, it, it's just not... A, or if you are going to model an election, you've got to model it more like the weather. Right, not like a, not, not like you're doing an experiment in you know high school physics, right? Uh, but 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 however you're gonna do it, you, you should really ensure that you're only putting good polls in. Now, now, if you go back and look at my my results here, good polls doesn't mean the source. Good polls doesn't mean the outcome. Good polls means the methodology, right? And I've said a few things, right? You know, like, I don't like the source or whatever, but, you know. Or, you know, this is a very... This is a source that that, that leans on my side of the spectrum, but I don't like their methodology, so we're going to discard that, right? It's not cherry-picking. It's not, you know, breaking things down ideologically. You're just looking at methodology, <laughs> And it happens to be at this point that all of the reliable polls using good methodology put Clinton up by a substantial margin. That's what the reliable polls say, without without exception. And the second thing is that you just don't model elections using regression analysis and a line of best fit. Because elections are not natural phenomena. They're not going to follow a trend line. That's absolutely meaningless. You don't want to smooth things out. Because then, what, what you do when you smooth things out like that is you're ignoring, you know, the factors that uh, that are driving uh, the, the, the responses. What you want to do is amplify the noise. Right, so when you get the signal and it's kind of fluttering like that, and you see a big bump, right, you don't want to just say that's, it's an outlier. You want to look at that and you want to hone in on that, right? And then you want to say, okay, has it, is this measuring something real and can it be reproduced? With elections, averaging things out to the mean like this is not, it, it, it's not uh, analytically coherent. One should expect that election polling will actually fly around all over the place.
right? So you're not going to see a trend line. You're not going to see it's not going to be linear, right? What you're going to see is it's going to float around all over the place like that, right? And you know it could be like like a week before the election, the polls could say one thing, and a week after the election, they could say something else completely, right? We've seen this happen, right? Where, you know, a week before the election, a candidate is, I, I, you know, one candidate is up, and then you know, on the week of the election, there's a dip, and then the week after the election, it's back to what it was the week before. An election is a snapshot. It's a moment in time. And while, yeah, you can, or you have to understand what the snapshot is based on the past, it's not going to follow some causal linear line. It's ridiculous. So, yeah, it may be true that a constant rate of change from now into infinity will give Trump 100% of the vote, 1,000% of the vote. I could say 1,000 years from now, It's ridiculous to apply it as a predictive at all, okay, even over a few months. It is cherry-picking data, okay? What he's doing is he's taking a really small part of, of a complex curve, and he's taking, essentially, the derivative of that curve, and he's using the derivative to project it forwards. When, you know, a smart analysis would be, okay, that's, it's not going to move based on the instantaneous rate of change, right? But you, you want to be, you know, it is, a, it is a regression analysis, but it's a more complicated one. It's not linear. And you want to find a curve of the best fit, right? And maybe you could find that. Most cases, you couldn't for the same reason that the linear model doesn't work. When you do an experiment in controlled conditions, okay, it, it's something, like one thing that happens, right? And then you can try to, uh, try, try to build relationships between different ideas, right? So you want to use something simple like force equals mass times acceleration. And then you can sort of build that, right? And you can find that correlation. And then you can predict in the future that the more, the more mass and the more acceleration, the higher the force. But, when, but during an election cycle, there's not one experiment, right? It's infinitely many experiments happening over and over again. And so maybe it's true that if you were to freeze time and nothing else was going to happen, but that's ridiculous. I'm not saying that what he's predicting is necessarily wrong, right? By some fluke, you might see a linear... But, but but there's no reason to think that his analysis is predictive at all, in any way. He's really just fucking around with numbers, pulling numbers out of his ass, and you know trying to make them using big words and trying to sound scientific. His argument does not make any sense. It's completely incoherent. You just can't do this. You can't do what he's doing. It's wrong. Okay, that said, I agree that he's right in pointing out that there's a lot of volatility right now, right? But I'd be more likely to argue that the volatility is careening towards a possible Clinton landslide. Um, one of the reasons being that the, the whole third party thing, right? Now, I know people will say that, you know, it, he's taking just as much from Johnson, but I mean, that's... 
maybe nationally, but if you look at the important states, I mean, if if Johnson does well in Georgia, it's gonna it's not it's not gonna help Trump, right? Clinton could win states like like Georgia, and North Carolina maybe got more complex causes, right? Partly demographic, but partly Johnson. And if he ends up running at eight, nine, ten percent in these states that were kind of maybe able to swing. And that combined with kind of a, I mean, even if even if there is only a small movement, right, a three four percent movement, that three four percent movement combined with that ten percent, you know, fall, which it see if you do the national polling right, and you see that okay, it's ten percent across the country, and it's split evenly from. Uh, Republican and Democrat, but but then when you look at it and you see, okay, that means that she's down ten points in Wisconsin, but winning anyways, or down ten points in New York, but winning anyways, and like it's like the whole ten percent voting for Johnson is Democrats in New York, and the whole ten percent voting uh, for Johnson in Georgia is Republican. Right. See, and and this goes back to something else I was saying about uniform swings. Right, you can't just take this and apply it the same way to every part of the country. You have to look at you know you, you have to realize that there's going to be a lot of variation there, and and you can probably find patterns regionally. Right, in solid, from what I've seen, the the idea that that in solid Republican areas, um, Johnson's support is more Republican holds up, and in more democratic areas. Um, Johnson's support is more uh, uh, democratic leaning. Also holds up. Okay, but I mean that's it, she's winning by much larger margins in New York than he is in even Texas, right? She's going to win New York by 25 points. So she can afford to lose ten percent. Even in Texas, I mean, if he wins by fifteen percent, or if if he would have been up by you know fifteen percent otherwise, but with the Johnson factor in now, it's you know seven eight. I mean that's Texas, right? In Georgia, if Trump would be winning by you know five points in Georgia otherwise, but because of Johnson. He's losing, right? I mean, you've got that. You've got the whole uh, conservative um, elites moving over, which might not have a big effect unless it starts trickling down, right? <clears throat> I don't think there's many Republicans that are going to listen to Meg Whitman, but there may be a lot that are going to listen to their to their pastors. And if the machinery starts trickling that down, you could start seeing, you know, the big... It could happen overnight, right? And this is what I'm suggesting, is that you're not going to see that, right? If, 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 this, if, if the landslide does happen, it'll be like you'll just wake up one day and the polls will be completely different. Okay? It's not... You're, you're not going to see a constant rate of change you're not going to see something that you can model that way. It's not going to be incremental. It's going to be an instantaneous break. Or at least, you know, happen over a couple of days. And again, I would behoove you to go back and look at previous data to see that in fact these dramatic switches do happen and not infrequently. So yeah, lots of volatility. To suggest the volatility makes the linear model more likely, I don't know. But as to the point, is, is it too early to run out of the clock? Broadly, yes, okay. 
but on the email specifically, which is what the article that he's referencing is talking about, I actually think the article is right, that it is better that she shuts up about that specific topic. Okay. What, what, I'm, what I'm going after so far on here is the idea that you can use correlative predictive modeling like this. Okay. That you can just find, do a regression analysis, you know, find your line of best fit and suggest that the future is predicted by the, the trends of the past like that. That's just not how elections operate. And I'm kind of picking on him right now. Um, I was picking on lots of people in Canada a few months ago. Um, I'll pick on lots of people in the future about this. I really think that this kind of approach needs to be thrown into the dustbin. It may work out from time to time by, by, by chance, by luck. But that doesn't mean it's right. My argument is that you can't predict it, right? And so I'm not going to tell you that there will be a landslide because then I would be contradicting myself. What I'm saying is that you need to look more at what political scientists are saying about what the um, fundamentals on the ground are, rather than what statisticians um, are, are presenting using their supposed scientific methods. And this is not anti-intellectual either. Anybody who is informed on the topic would tell you that Silver is trying to pull one over on you here.